Hey kids, it's the Drive to School podcast. I'm Pastor Goodman, and today we're going to talk about some things that you'll see in church this Sunday. We take a look at some of the upcoming readings or hymns that, that are probably going to show up in your church on Sunday, so you can go in finding even more good gifts of God, Jesus, for you, for the forgiveness of your sins. And today, uh, we're getting ready to hear about this story where Jesus turned water into wine, which is, according to the internet, like one of the greatest miracles, at least when it comes to jokes. It's right up there with walking on water as to why Jesus can't do cannonballs and why he only orders water water at restaurants. You get it if you get it. Here's the thing. In all of it, the whole story is kind of uncomfortable because we don't really know what to do with it. This is Jesus' first public miracle, and his mom asks him to help the people who run out of wine at the party, and Jesus, he says, woman, and everybody, (laughs) the hour has not yet come for the Son of Man to be glorified. It's not time. But all the same, Mary insists, and so Jesus has uh, the 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 steward, the well, the the wedding hosts, the the the, the wedding worker people, fill up the w- jars that are used for the Jewish rites of purification, church jars, with water, and he turns them into wine. The wine is so good that the steward comes up later and he says, "Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the cheap wine." But you have done the opposite. It shows what happened here. Not just Jesus turned water into wine, but Jesus turned water into wine so that the drunk people can get drunker. It, it, I don't know, this is a kid's podcast. I'm sure you don't know this, but um, once you drink too much, you stop caring what it tastes like. Jesus contributed to this. Don't say you never learned anything on this podcast. It's uncomfortable from the way that he talks to his mom to uh, the way that he would take jars used for churchly things and then lend them to a divine beer run. In all of it, it's easier to make jokes than find the reason because most of us are actually a little bit more comfortable with the stone jars. They're very simple. They are inoffensive. You do the little washing ritual and then you can say, it's done. I can measure it. Look at me being better than I was before. And I think that's actually why we get this miracle. Jesus goes and fills up these jars that I like so much because they let me measure myself and my self-improvement. He fills them up with wine for a people who have already had too much. He turns water into wine for anybody who has ever walked out of the doors of their church on a Sunday, ate lunch, and then realized they actually felt exactly the same as they did before they went with all the same problems, all the same vices. See, whatever happened in this miracle, we are told that it manifested God's glory. And the disciples believed in him. It is a great sign, which means it has to be more than just a divine beer run. Like, if you are God, that's not even that hard. The prophets have done better. Water into wine, it's good for jokes. But as a miracle, it's not nearly as impressive as Moses parting the Red Sea or, like, calling down the pillars of of fire. There's hardly any explosives with this. But it manifests God's glory glory. And it does this because of who God gives it to. If you actually want to see the miracle that that happens here, it's not jokes about alcohol. It's jokes about sinners. There is no reason at all to waste good wine on people who have had more than they can handle already. They don't appreciate it. They don't enjoy it for what it is. They they waste it. There's no reason to keep dumping money into a junk car. When you are putting more into fixing your car than a car payment, just get something nicer don't throw good money after bad. And so there is no reason for God to send good gifts after sinners. You don't really care. You don't really appreciate the forgiveness enough. You waste it. You abuse it. You can say otherwise, but here's the thing. Just after here and in the stead and by the command of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You go home and do the same stupid stuff all over again. I know because I do it too. So this is how God shows you what kind of God he is. This is how he manifests his glory. He gives you more. More mercy. More forgiveness. Not because you deserve it by making good choices. Not because you have improved your life in a measurable way. Not because I just hit my elbow on the table and it hurt. But because, well, our Lord loves sinners. And because the wedding... It was on the third day, and the third day means something. The third day is the day that things live. The third day is the the day that whether or not you appreciated enough, Christ rose from the grave. He already did all the work. He bled and died to forgive your sins, my sins, the sins of everybody in all the world, each and every sin. They had a real cost. You can see how much was paid for him. Jesus bled and died for you, for the people who cried at the foot of the cross, for the people who denied it three times before the rooster crowed. Jesus died. For the ones who appreciated it, the ones who had no idea what was happening, for you. 
Jesus died for you. And so on the third day, there gets to be a party. On the third day, there gets to be a wedding at Cana because the bridegroom claims the church, the bride. He celebrates Jesus as the bridegroom. We are the bride. We are the church. And he manifests his glory, not in power, but in mercy, by giving abundantly to these sinners who don't deserve it, but God still wants us to have it. He gives us more than we can handle by the law and more than we can handle by the gospel too. And so now when we leave church and we realize that we are the same kind of sinner that has not improved nearly enough as we wish that we did, we can go back to church anyway, not questioning whether or not it worked, but knowing God is actually there to give us more, more forgiveness, more mercy, more love, more hope, more life. In the midst of all of the awful stuff that goes on in our life, the Lord gives good gifts to the undeserving, and that is worth rejoicing over. That's, that's the whole point. Jesus doesn't wait for us to appreciate him enough. Church is not a chance to measure how good you are by dressing up and going through empty rituals week after week. It is Jesus sending more good after bad. Every single week in your church for you, there is the forgiveness of sins. There is good wine that is the blood of Jesus for you. You can't change it by appreciating it more. You can't change it by appreciating it less. He made it this way and you can't undo it and that's good. Because now it can actually address the things that you can't do right either. It can forgive your sins. See, church is not set up so that the most appreciative can show how appreciative they are. The most heartfelt can give more praise. The wisest can gather and be wiser still than everybody else. It's for God to deliver mercy to you so that whatever you have done, however empty you feel, whether you feel it or not at all, notice it or not at all, appreciate it or not at all, Jesus is in, you. Jesus is in your church for you. He shows up. He gives his glory by sending good after bad, by being merciful to sinners. It's wonderful, and it's yours. So go to church and get it.